downtown Panama City. And my name is Carlton Cartwright. Today's date is um, November 26, 2019, and it is Tuesday. Um, with me is uh, Skip Eckhart, Charles, right? He's helping me uh, with my sound. He's been a great roadie. And we're here today to interview uh, Miss, what is your name? Cecile Schoon. And Miss Schoon, um, Cecile, were you drafted or enlisted? I was an officer, and I had I came through the ROTC program. Uh, when, when is your birthday? August 15, 1959. And your current address? 512 Bunkers Cove, okay. Panama City, Florida. How long do you live here? Um, 33 years. Okay. And what year did you go into the military? I got my commission in 1981 and took an education after graduating college, took an educational delay to go to law school and came back on active in, um, I guess, 1984. Okay. All right, um, so what were you doing just before you went into the service? College? College, Where? and then uh, when undergrad was Harvard University in, in Cambridge. Uh-huh. And uh, did that, and then went on to University of Virginia Law School in what? Charlottesville. Okay. And you majored in law? Undergrad, no, I was a studio artist, and oh, uh, pre-architecture and pre, you know, anything into the design elements and the uh, art world. I'm just curious, have you ever done anything career-wise in the field of art? Yes. Um, throughout, uh, I guess, um, when I was in college, I taught art lessons uh, and, and did art seminars. I have uh, put my pieces in a few art galleries, including this one, okay. where the interview is taking place. Um, I've done designs and posters and invitations and things of that nature, not for pay, just volunteer work. And that would be the extent of it, I think. Okay, but never as a way to make a living. Have you ever done it in that capacity? Well, when I was teaching in, when I was in uh, college, yes, I was, be, I was paid. Oh, okay. And so it went towards my college fees. But you know, not for a long term. It was a summer, summer endeavor. How did um, how did your parents feel about you going into the military? Um, I think they were very proud. Uh, my father is uh, was born in another country, in the Caribbean, and chose to become an American. Was very very proud of that. And so, for really all all three of his four children, um, we had military scholarships, and he was quite proud that we were going to be officers and. Uh, represent, he thought, the greatest nation in the world. Where, where, were, you, where were you born? I was born in Washington, D.C. Oh, okay. But right. I was raised in the Caribbean from when I was 11 to 15. Oh. After my father came to the, he came to the States on a scholarship. Right. Uh, in college, met my mom, they married. And um, down the road, he became a Peace Corps director and they sent him back to his area where he was raised, born which was in the Caribbean. So he was the Peace Corps director for the Northern Islands. And the whole family went with him and we lived in Antigua and that's where I was raised from 11 to 15 years old. Okay. Okay, so um, at what point in your college experience were you introduced to the military experience? Okay. Well, um, I, I grew up in D.C., came back to the States, finished school in the Washington, D.C. area, um, and um, I was a good student, and I happened to test fairly well on the standardized test. Mm -hmm. And probably because in the British school system, uh, it was quite common, which I was trained in the Caribbean British school system. Okay. Uh, it was quite common for people to have multiple languages, so I came back to the States. I was in Latin, French, Spanish, and English. So I actually wrote and would read perfect English 
because I've learned it from different languages okay. and how, to, how what is the meaning of English vis-a-vis -vis another language. And so what you basically learn your own language. Bottom line, I did very well in those standardized tests and I got a lot of offers for scholarship. Okay. And so the I got one from the military. Right. The Air Force offered me a scholarship and several of the um, uh, military academies offered me as a, a full ride too. And my father being born in another country had been here as in America. We listened to the guidance counselor and she thought the best thing was it Harvard, of course. <laughs> so we went to Har I went to Harvard and I did my ROTC training at MIT. Oh, okay. And the, the ROTC scholarship not only provided uh, me a scholarship to go to school, but they also had a stipend uh -huh. for, you know, um, incidentals and books and things like that. So their scholarship was actually the best financially. And again, my father was very proud for us to be involved in the military, so it seemed like a good fit. That, so I, I did my uh, ROTC training at MIT. Okay, um, it's in Massachusetts, isn't it? Yeah, yeah right, down the, right down the river, I'm gonna say down the street, down the river, down the Charles River from, from Harvard, and on good days you, I can walk, 20, 20, 30 minute walk okay. from Harvard campus to MIT. At that time, Harvard did not allow ROTC on the campus. Oh. Because it had been kicked off during the Vietnam. Uh, Engagement. Right, uh -huh. and uh, protests. And, right. and they were not happy, and that was one of the things that happened. Um, so, uh, what? how my ROTC actually went, well, you can see my shirt. I got in this, it's a, it says Harvard Track. Uh -huh. And I did sports pretty much year round um, when I was at Harvard. And so I missed a lot of ROTC training. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't there all the time, you know, during the weekend to march and, and to learn the military thing. So I would take tests on the military training to pass them. And I would have to write papers because I wasn't able to drill all the time. I was there about 50% of the time. Okay. So my ROTC experience was unusual in two aspects. One. I had to leave my campus and go to another campus to train. So there wasn't many Harvard students doing that. And then on top of it, even when I was there in my detachment, because I competed, you know, going to different universities and college to compete, I, was, I missed a lot of Saturdays. Mm -hmm. So I still had my own like little silo experience, but it was good and I, I still have uh, friends from my ROTC experience. Okay, um, so when did you go to the basic training? Uh, Plattsburgh Air Force Base. Really? And, wow, that's extraordinary. I wonder why you went to basic training there. What year was that? Um, would have been 82 or 83. Okay. All Wait right. a minute, excuse me. I graduated in 81, so it would have been 79 or 80. Okay. And so, okay, you, how long was basic training? Do you remember? Um, it was over a month. It, it was six to eight weeks. Okay. And so, uh, how did you, how, how was that experience for you? Well, being a serious athlete at the time, right. the physical part wasn't any big deal okay. because I was rail thin. Imagine me minus 40 pounds. Right. I'll see you. You know, I've been, you play soccer, it's 90 minutes of running fast and short, so it's very... So you were in shape. I was in shape, so that part wasn't a problem. Getting up early in the morning, eating food quickly, yes. you know, uh, making the beds properly, marching, um, knowing all the rank, you know, those were more things that I had to get accustomed to. But a big part of it, the physical part, I was in a way, kind of prepared. Just you were ahead of the game. Right. <laughs> okay. I, I came in fit, I, and I ended up losing another 10 pounds just okay. because we were running in the heat. Uh -huh. You know, running in the heat, and then they wanted you to get a little bit accustomed to running with a pack on your back, right. running with your boots on. So I came there fit, and I left even fitter, probably. Okay. <laughs> How did you get along with your instructors? Um. Well, uh, this was Air Force. 
Right. Air Force is not known for harsh, rough treatment uh -huh. in training. They're known more for, you know, very firm, you know, you know, yes sir, no ma'am, you know, very uh, military discipline and all like that was serious. But we didn't have, I don't think, anybody that was super fearsome. Uh -huh. And so I got along with them well. Okay. Okay, um, and your fellow soldiers? Uh, well, they were, uh, they were uh, fun-loving, weird, you know, young, idealistic. I remember we had a couple of trips to Montreal we rented a big van and we piled ourselves in two hotel rooms and we went to uh, dance halls and and loved the beautiful city of Montreal. So we got along. We, that we not only were we there no, during you know the whole eight weeks, but we actually went on you know weekend trips, which was allowed as long as we were there to start. So, and I was just looking at photographs of all of us, okay. you know, for our class. Uh, were there any casualties in basic training? Anybody get hurt? Did you get hurt? I did not get hurt. Uh, pe some people got hurt. A couple mm -hmm. people were discharged from the camp from bad shin splints. I think a couple, one or two people broke their legs or mm -hmm. their ankles. So yeah, there okay. were a couple of people. You know, it was it was a it was hard. Uh -huh. It was you know physically de very demanding and. Right. It, it, I, I would imagine someone who has just lived a normal life doing that would have been a huge reach. Right. Um, okay, so after basic training, where did you go to tech school? A tech school is at Maxwell Air Force Base. Where? Maxwell oh, Air in Force Alabama. Base. Yes, Montgomery, mm -hmm. Alabama. It's um, where Air Force has a, a really big university campus-like environment where a lot of officer training, after you become an officer, there's um, Squadron Officer School, SOS, mm -hmm. and there were upper level classes in school, so they actually had, you know, uh, I guess, military professors. Right. And, and the JAG Corps, which I was in the JAG Corps, Judge okay. Advocate General, uh -huh. they had their whole setup there. That's where the JAG School was. Oh. So we had a lot of uh, colonels and generals, and they wanted us to know the military thing, but they were preparing us with law of war. UCMJ. Right, right. military justice. Right, U Uniform the courts, Code of Military Justice. Right, we had the court's manual, which was our Bible, uh -huh. and um, so we needed to, for good order and discipline, so that we, we were trained on how to have field courts, you know, how to, just the whole process of our military Courts Martial, which is a unique system. Mm -hmm. And we were also taught uh, quite a bit, because we would become advisors to generals and colonels in war. You would be, you know, not at the line, the front line. Uh -huh. You would be not too far away, sitting with the general, and the, you know, big screen would come up, and they would give you the facts, and they would say, uh, a hospital is within, you know, half a block of this known place where we have we've got intel. They're going, they have all this munitions, and they're going to bomb the, you know. And what do you do? What do you advise the commander? So they would have us go through real world scenarios because that was a big part of our job is to the law of war and right. to advise the commander. The you know the gray area and the clearly verboten, we cannot do this, versus this is a green light, this this is per, this is within the realm of the law of and the war. Yeah. So code of ethics was a, an issue that you tried to stay within the, the boundaries of, so to speak? Absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely. And after the Holocaust and mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the world courts that were, that evolved, the Nuremberg courts and the law of war, it became set rules of what was acceptable, you know, casualty loss, what was acceptable risk, and things of that nature. How long was that school? That was, I think, three months. It was lengthy. Okay, I, I was starting to think it was about 24 months. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, think 24 weeks. 
Oh, 24 weeks? Yeah, that, that, that's about 24 right. Weeks, okay. About 24 weeks, yeah. That's yeah, about, about right. six months? Uh, oh, three, which, three months or six months? Sorry. It was, I think it was closer to three months. Okay. Uh, got married just before that. Got married Was your January. husband in the military? No, he's okay. a civilian. He was my classmate in law school. Oh, okay. So uh, we got married in January, and we went immediately, we had a short honeymoon, went immediately to my tech school, okay. the JAG school. And we drove down into Panama City, where we still live, okay. where this interview is taking place, right. March 11, 1985. <laughs> so within that time frame, uh -huh. which is about the three months, right. was the training because we, we left immediately and came down here. Uh, just to jump ahead for a minute, um, how many years of total service active duty did you have? Almost five. Okay. Active duty and the rest was reserve. Uh, and how many years reserve did you do? I did a fifteen. Okay. Like so Sixteen or fifteen. So over twenty. Just over twenty. Just over twenty. Okay. So. Um, after anybody get any casualties, anybody get hurt or have any accidents in, in tech school during that period, that 12 week period? Um, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. We marched mm -hmm. and we had, we had drill, but it wasn't anything like basic training. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Well, so where, where was your first duty base? Panama City. Oh, okay. And I was stationed at Tyndall Air Force Base. Tyndall, okay. And how long were you there? I was there my whole active duty time. Really? Yes. How many um, years was that? Three years, four years? Uh, I was active duty about five years. Okay, all right. And um, had opportunity uh, to, you know, move, because usually your tours back then was about two, two and a half years. Right. And considering that my husband was also an attorney, Mm -hmm. And he'd taken the Florida bar when we got my orders to Florida. And it's somewhat difficult for lawyers to keep taking a bar. It might take you six months to pass the bar. Yeah. Take the, first you study for the bar, that's six months. And then you take the bar. Then you wait another six months to find out if you pass and the background check. So you're out for a year. Then you hunt for a job. Oh, got a job. Bye-bye, I'm leaving in six months. <laughs> right. Not a very easy route for a, a, a military spouse who was also a civilian attorney. Right. So we, that was one of the reasons when my tour in the office, because military lawyers, you usually start in the Air Force of Lloyd, you start in the commander's office uh -huh. and you're the commander's lawyer and you're right. part of the commander's team, right. the staff judge advocate. And as you get seasoned, try a few cases and demonstrate that you have some common sense, they'll you can ask to be the area defense counsel, which I moved over to my own little office by myself. I ran my own shop, right. defending all of the military active duty. Okay. So that was my job. Okay. And that was how I was able to extend and be the five years. Ah, okay. So that, that sort of secured your position as far as being stationary. Which was good for my husband. Exactly. Well, good for your family life. Yes. You're right. Right. So <laughs> well, it was a big deal to run your own shop. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and very against the grain of most people's military experiences, uh -huh. because I had no commanding officer on that base oh. in my chain of command, and that was done deliberately, so I would not feel obligated to go light on my defense of any airman, major, captain. Pilot, you know, I also defended people if they were going to get their wings taken from them in flight school. You know, they would have training. I mean, anything that came up with a professional licensure or military justice, right. they would they would have access to me. They could hire their own attorney, private, but they would all have access to me. And so, they wanted someone who was independent and would be free to oppose the commander who might be saying, get this girl or guy off the base, take their wings or whatever, you know, put them in the brig, whatever they wanted to do. Uh -huh. It was my job to make sure that everything was done fairly, that the person got the best defense. Um, you know, if it was an acquittal was what, you know, you could get and you would try to get the acquittal, you know, just like anybody else on the outside. And so my chain of command left the base 
and went to Montgomery and then went to DC. Uh -huh. So when I had issues or problems, I'd get on the phone. Because so my little office was off to itself. Mm -hmm. I had two paralegals as my assistant. Okay. And uh, the military believes in a lot of training. They, everybody got trained very well, but it was it was quite an experience and actually was a great uh, step for what I do now. Is I'm a private attorney. I have my own office. Right. And so like oh I got a little taste of it in the military. Okay. Uh, um. So you got you started your reserve duty what year? Yes. What year? Um, 90. Okay, and so from 90 to, what, 2005? Yes. Um, when you, you, for a year, every, every year for the two weeks, did, did, were you deployed, did you get to travel? I did get to travel um, some. Did, did you travel any while on your five years uh, active duty? Um, Would you want R&R? Whatever. Where'd you go while, while you were on that five years of active duty? Five years of active duty. Um, a couple of times I would get assignments to do a court martial at another base, either oh. because it was a conflict of interest. Like where? I went to uh, McDill in Tampa. Right. I went to Keesler in Biloxi. Right. Um, I think those are the, the only two bases where I actually had court martial work. Um, did you go on vacation? Oh, yeah. Where'd you go? Oh, uh, we would often go to the D.C. area uh -huh. because uh, my husband and I are the oldest of the, we both have four children in the family. Uh -huh. So we had uh, siblings who were still in high school. Right. Oh, so okay. we would go home to see the family frequently uh -huh. and it turned out we lived 20 minutes from each other. Oh, so cool. going, <laughs> we didn't know each other right. growing up, but going home meant seeing everybody. Uh -huh. So going to D.C. at least twice twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, my father's family, I might have mentioned, is from the Caribbean. Right. And so my parents would often go home to visit my father's family. Where? where? Uh, we, they lived in Grenada. Uh -huh. And we also had family in Antigua. So we would, I'm, uh, friends in Antigua. So we would go back and forth. And we had cousins in Trinidad. So we would mostly go north and maybe every other year we'd go to the islands. Right. That's what we did. Okay. Um, and so during uh, your reserve time, were you deployed anywhere? Um, and when you did your two weeks, you know? No, that's a really interesting question for me and for many women. Uh -huh. uh, when I have three children, Yeah. Um, and whenever I was pregnant and or nursing, uh -huh. you could not get orders. Oh, really? So that had a big impact and it, for women my age. I think things have changed, but women my age, women who had babies had a much lower promotion rank mm -hmm. because I wasn't able to be deployed. I didn't get to go travel with the general you know, because I either, for, I guess, seven years of my reserve time, wow. I was either pregnant or nursing. Uh -huh. So I was offline. And I and <laughs> wanted to ask you about that, the impact or the effect that it had on you since you are a woman. And also, even more um, critically, I might add, uh, being a black woman, uh, now you you were an officer. Yes. Okay. Oh, by the way, what what was your rank when you finally retired? I was a major. You were a major, so you worked your way all the way up to the ranks, <coughs> from um, second lieutenant. Right. To and through first lieutenant, and then. Uh, uh, um, right. I think. Captain I, major. Go ahead. Some of my peers, women who never married, never had kids. Uh -huh. A lot of them were, uh, they finished as a light colonel, lieutenant colonel. Okay, oh wow. And um, men frequently did. But, you know, I paid the mommy price. You know, um, I tended to write well and I got honors in my writing through the legal. Right. Uh, and, and generals would write and say, hey, come to D.C. We love to have you in D.C., but that wasn't going to work 
with me with children. Mm -hmm. You know, so an assignment or, you know, the opportunity to be, which the military is like a lot of other organizations. When the top echelon people notice that they have some talent, they want to bring the talent to them. Right. And I got quite a few offers. Uh -huh. But because I had either pregnant or nursing or a little one at home, right. it, it wasn't going to be a perfect match for mommy to be gone for three months. And that was my personal choice. Right. But I feel like certainly the physical carrying of the baby men could not do and nor could they nurse uh -huh. so there was like biologically preordained limits uh -huh. on things I could do and then on top of it I chose to be home with my children and not be away because of the way our family was structured I was for a long time the main caregiver my husband basically kept working full time and I went to part time so all of these things, it's not an uncommon story, but right. um, the part about being excluded from duty when I was perfectly physically fine. Uh -huh. I never had preeclampsia, I never had anything that would have prohibited me from doing work and, and doing uh, training, uh, act, uh, my reserve training, because I was pregnant. It was just a rule that was just imposed on any woman regardless of your physical health, which I was quite healthy. Okay. So that, you know, it was a little heartburn there, and I, I didn't think it was fair at the time, and I still don't think that it's fair. Okay. And you mentioned the race issue? Yeah, well, yeah, discrimination of many, yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, I would say that one of my bosses came from a very southern environment and I think he was fascinated by me but also troubled and I definitely got different treatment and it wasn't it wasn't nice uh -huh. and um, it was so bad that they sent an investigator down to query what was going on and I really could have cost that gentleman his job right and I mean, the things that were going on were just on its face, evident. I would sometimes be given the workload of three people because the signatures coming out of the office would be my signature. Right. So this is not something I'm making up right. in my head. Uh -huh. um, and then there would be people sitting around reading the paper of paler complexion, oh. things like that. Okay. So that was not good. I would complain to my husband and he um, would say, well, you're getting better training than they are. You're gonna be better, more well-rounded, and you'll be able to do more, which is an interesting way to look at it. Right. And it was actually somewhat true, right. although it was, it was hurtful mm -hmm. to have that burden. Yes. Um, I also saw during my reserve work, um, that was when I was active duty. Uh -huh. I also saw during my reserve work similar biases, somewhat towards me, but also towards other active duty. Because I was in and out, you know, when you're a reservist, you come in for, right. you do your two weeks in the summer usually, right. and then you would do approximately 12 days throughout the year. So right. I would be bopping in and out, and I could see as an outsider, so to speak, uh, familiar outsider, right. <laughs> yes. what was going on. And I would, it happened several times, I would see usually white men, uh -huh. um, usually big strapping, you know, uh, statute advocates, assistant statute advocates, and the ones who seemed to be the favored ones with the colonel, the, the judge advocates, mm -hmm. um, would be the ones who would sit around and talk in the office, shoot the breeze, and they didn't produce that much. They weren't good, that good of lawyers. They were okay. You'd always have to check the work. You know, was it the right article out of the Uniform Code of Military right, Justice? Okay. What did, was it charged properly? Oh my God, this is gonna get busted because you know this thing wasn't done. Where's the evidence? You know, things like that. You would have to check up on them. So it was inferior work. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, average to inferior. But they were able to get by. They would be the ones going on the trips. They would get the training. And I would see another person who was hard working. Right worked so hard, would come in so early, 
They weren't always in the colonel's office, ha, 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 right? They were the ones doing the work, kind of like my situation. And they were sometimes not rewarded. So I was like, hmm, it let me know in any system people are human and these kinds of human interactions, sometimes unfairnesses can, can happen. And the wise thing to do was that the staff judge advocates should have made sure that the work was distributed evenly and should have made sure who's holding up the office, who's getting the work done, who's making all their metrics. You know, they would say how many cases you did in a certain amount of time, what was your turnover, what was your success rate. They would tra track you and they would look and say, who's carrying the office? This guy who's always there versus this one over there, ha ha ha, you're the, with the colonel. Right. So, you know, it's human. It's human and the frailties of personality and packaging. In, in this particular instance, the gentleman that was being overlooked was Greek. Okay. He was short, okay. curly hair. Right. Interesting last name, which I won't call out and remember him to this day. Uh -huh. And he was the one carrying the office. And the gentleman that was kind of like trifling was six foot two, redheaded, big strapping, Scottish looking guy. Uh -huh. And he wasn't carrying the water. It was just plain as day. But that was, he was the preferred one. Mm -hmm. So I would try to tell my the young man doing all the work as I was maturing. I was the older ca captain and the major coming in, you know, oh, Major Stokes, you've been here a while. Oh, we saw some of your active duty paperwork, you know, because I would do procedures, you know, you review things and it still goes into the file on this issue. Right. And we have this issue again. Oh, we had research. Oh, you did that, you know, and it's just fun. We laugh, talk about it. And uh, I say, you know, dude, you know, look what's going on here. You know, you need to get that coffee and ha-ha with the colonel, you know, because so-and-so is getting all the bennies and you're doing all the work. So the people need to feel comfortable with you and know that, you know, you're out there on the team, you know. So and there was, you witnessed a certain amount of preferential treatment. For real. That was, that was And not, I think a lot deserved. of it, yeah. a lot of it was unconscious. I mean, it's back to unconscious preferences okay. that back in the day certainly existed and of course they exist today. You know, uh, you generally tend towards people that look like you, look like your children. And in those situations, the colonel was looking eye to eye to the other guy. <laughs> His big strapping guy and ha, ah, you know, maybe they played basketball, whatever. Right. You know, the commonality mm -hmm. factor. Um, sometimes if you're a little different female, minority, a different ethnic group, different physically, you have to be aware of those unconscious biases of those who are judging you and working with you. And you know, a wise person would acknowledge that, and not that it's fair, but you would try to bring your own qualities uh, to counterbalance that. And also look around and say, okay, um, this colonel likes people standing around talking with coffee, even though they might burn 30 minutes or an hour of time a day in talking. So maybe I should talk and hang out with them at least 10 minutes a day. Right. <laughs> you know, so you, you, you learn to try to, if you want to survive and you want to keep your good humor and, 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 and not be covered up, you learn to- Play the game? Um, I call it, it could be called play the game, but just be aware of your surroundings okay. and um, and not let other people's unconscious and or conscious biases limit you. Okay. Did you ever see in combat, by the way? No, for the same reason of being pregnant and right. female. I mean, I there, there weren't a time that the conflict was going on and quite a few of the reservists in our, because there, there'd be like a cadre of, of lawyers that would be assigned to Tyndall. We would often rotate and see each other, right? And several of them went to combat zones. Oh, okay. Or they backfilled in Germany <coughs> and the active duty then went to closer to the lines in Southeast Asia. That was not uncommon. It wasn't even con considered if you were pregnant or nursing. So and I was during those, those times. Right. Uh, 
So you're saying some people in your unit did go to war zones. Yes. Were there any casualties from, you know, that, it, that included people uh, that deployed to those zones from your unit? Not from the JAGs, okay. but certainly you would deploy, a JAG would be a part of, uh, of a bigger unit. Uh -huh. Right. And we would service them. We, we, one of, we did the course, the court martialing, the military discipline, very key in a war zone to keep, keep things running smoothly, uh, to immediately address discipline issues, immediately meet out, you know, you know, the commander get involved and do the investigation and settle the dispute so that troops don't end up fighting each other, pulling guns, pulling knives. I mean, you gotta handle the problem can quickly. You, can you? So you would be there with your troops to okay. service the military justice needs and also family needs. Right. Can you give me two of those instances that, that really stand out in, in your mind that were, you know, pretty... What kind of instances? Well, that, at, just in your own, from your own experience, uh, from your experience, yeah, from your experience, Two instances that are really like unforgivable as far as that's concerned, or, or really doesn't, well, you know, from the combat experience or from your overall experience, two instances that are really okay. memorable. Okay. Um, I was able to participate in the readiness, mm -hmm. getting the troops ready to be deployed, right. and that was emotional. And those were real people, and they left, and not all of them came back. Mm -hmm. So we would do their wills. We would update their wills, their powers of attorney. There's who's going to take care of their children. Um, there were single parents, and we had to do paperwork for them to have someone to have uh, permanent custody, permanent temporary custody. Well, sorry, um, not it was not permanent temporary. It would be temporary, but court ordered custody. In some states, they would need that. So that was very serious. Mm -hmm and um, very, I guess, emotionally draining for the lawyers, um, some of whom then would deploy with the team. I, was, I never deployed with them, but I, I would come back. This is a lot that happened when I was a reservist. I would, because I would be in and out, like I said, the 12 extra days and then the two weeks. Right. And I'd say, how's the team? You know, the team that deployed, and they'd say, so-and-so died, mm -hmm. so-and-so was bombed, so-and-so, you know, had a nervous breakdown, whatever mm -hmm. had happened. And sometimes it was somebody that I had actually spoken to. Right. So I didn't ever experience anything firsthand. Right. But just the idea of, wow, I'm the last stop. Buck stops here. Mm -hmm. Because we are trying to get help them get their whole lives in order mm -hmm. for in case the worst were to happen. So you kind of really sit with someone and get a real bird's eye view of what their issues are, their problems and try to make it right, and make it right for the military so they could be sent off. So okay. that, that, was, that was one of my experiences. And then I chatted with some JAGs who were deployed overseas. And what I heard from them, and it's always struck me, is how devastating the stress and um, being away, being, in, being out of pocket, being in a, like a whole nother zone and they were much closer to the line, and then they were then seeing people come back with their issues and their problems, and how hard it was on the JAG office to one, be the military justice, and then try to provide what we call legal assistance, mm -hmm. limited le legal assistance to people with their families and things of that nature. And what he said was that it was really hard on the JAG Corps, mm -hmm. and a lot of people ended up coming back that would get divorced. It had changed them so radically, and whatever went on over there was so devastating, they could no longer mesh with their family when they came back. And this is Jacks, not to mention the actual soldiers and people on the flight line side, they probably had it even worse, but just the Jags Association who were on, in the war zone or right near them, the trauma, that happened to everybody was just a high rate of divorce and family problems. Okay. So I did not experience that at all myself. I would never went. Right. But it was painful because these are people I knew. Right. 
and I had gone to school with, and I, they were coming back hurt, and they were coming back emotionally hurt, and coming back you know, with, that, with losses that go beyond the physical. Okay, I understand. Um, did you receive any award citations? Um, yes, I received um, the Air Force Commendation Medal two times, and mo maybe more specifically to my career field, we had an award for the JAGS called for writing well, uh -huh. and I received the Bronze Star a couple oh. of times okay. for right. my legal writing. Uh, but uh, apparently it wasn't difficult for you to stay in touch with your family, your, your entire military career, active duty and reserve. Did you have an issue staying in touch with your family? No. Okay. Right. I, I made sure. Right. We made sure that all of our trips pretty much over our entire lo married life, because I married just before I, we came down here to, mm -hmm. to Panama City. Um, we, both, we both committed to each other that we would do everything we could to stay in touch with our families, and we did. Okay. How was the food? On base? All the way, everything. Basic training, tech school, five years in reserve. Right. Uh, basic training and food was good, but you didn't have much time to eat it. Right. So <laughs> you would just be in there in a child time. You'd be, I think it'd be like 50 minutes. So you hit the door, grab your food, sit down, and eat. And don't be trying to get any seconds because you barely even get that down. Right. And then you had the next crew that had to come in. So right. yeah, but probably everybody lost weight. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the food was good, what you could get. And then um, uh, the food in the JAG school. It was good, you know, it wasn't, it, well, I don't think it was good as, as basic training. I think they really felt bad for us in basic training, trying to make it good, okay. but it was fine. <laughs> and then at the, when I was active duty, the officers club and the enlisted club on um, base was excellent. Right. I always went through the hotline because my mother was a stay at home mom mm -hmm. and I never had to eat cold food. So my friend would be right beside me. She'd be zooming over to the sa sandwiches. And I'd be like, I'm not eating that, that's not real food. I mean, Going through the hotlines, I wanted my cooked food that right. I've always had my whole life. Right. Okay. Do you feel like you ever was there ever a period while you were in the service where you didn't have the the supplies that you needed to do your job? Hmm. Ever come up short on whatever you needed uh, as far as I don't know you you were, you went in during the computer age, right? When things were picked I up. I started. Right. Uh. At the beginning of the computer age, right. and when I started, we still had paralegals. Uh -huh. We were very much like the civilian side. So when I first started, I had a paralegal and I would dictate, uh -huh. and they would take shorthand, and my documents would appear miraculously. Right. <laughs> I would edit them, and then they started with computers, which I was like, "What is this?" You know, and so we we had to get more familiar, and over time, then you know, you would be expected to basically draft your documents and then maybe the, in, the your enlisted assistant would pretty it up and get the lines organized and you know but you would be expected to do the bulk of the input overall your level of pressure and stress um, you're here today so you handled it but you know what is your what's your take on it as far as uh, stressors and, and pressures throughout your, your military career? Hmm. Well, I didn't have that time when I was being unfairly burdened with work. And that was very stressful uh -huh. and hard, hard to bear. And um, I had no children at the time. So I, that would have made it harder if I'd had to work those hours. Because I was coming in, I was coming in an hour before everybody else, and I was staying two hours behind everybody else. Right. So I mean, and then private in the private legal world, that's the norm. So like, why are you complaining? But it, uh, it, you, everything is relative to the people beside you. So when you see everybody else clocking in at the normal hours and leaving a little early, and you're still there, that was hard. But my husband's attitude about it, I think, um, was helpful to me, and that I realized, hey. I am getting trained to be a claims officer, uh, try a court martial, and do administrative discharges, and I know it better than they do now. So, you know, that put me in a position to be able to do more work and better work. 
strong emotion. It could be gratitude, uh, anger, frustration, confusion, um, even a prayer. I would write it down. And so I find my little poem, so right. to speak, and it takes me right back. So I have those that pop up, as, as a, but not like in a book diary. Did you use your GI Bill during, the, uh, during or after the service? Um, I did in, uh, with one or two courses and then um, did not follow up with it, with uh, probably child rearing and the rest of it. I think about possibly utilizing it again, but I've, I've gotten involved in some um, community work right. that's very compelling mm -hmm. to me. I'm, I'm involved with the restoration of voting rights for former felons okay. who finished their sentences. And there's actually a fairly high percentage of them are veterans because a lot of veterans have come back with emotional issues and problems that sometimes they try to solve, you know, try to self-medicate. And that can lead to DUIs and fisticuffs and marital problems, police being called, you know, they get a record. Right. Because it's not being, it wasn't dealt with and they just, you know, coming out of the service. Right. They just got yeah. out and they're in society and they don't have the supports. So, but that's not why I did it, but it's been because of the veteran. Mm -hmm. It's something I learned about. But um, all that to say, that's I, most of my volunteer hours are spent, and, you know, probably 30 hours a week working on those issues for the state through the League of Women Voters. So that's something that's, I, my children are out of the house, <laughs> and now I have the League, right. and Amendment 4, which is what, I work for, but it, it's a, in a funny way, it really does tie in with my military military training because it's all about, it's the best of America. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, restoration, forgiveness, mm -hmm. it's being a citizen, it's being able to vote and have your voice heard. And that's essentially what the military is here for, to make sure the rest of our society can have those freedoms and rest at peace. And, and, and have freedom of speech and have all of these things. And so the restoration of rights is very close to my heart and it feels like I'm being that American. Mm -hmm. And I'm con actually <coughs> continuing some of the powerful experiences of being active duty and being a reservist. Because putting on the uniform and carrying out those duties, whatever they may have been, definitely made me feel closer to the nation made me feel grateful to the nation. It made me feel like I was doing my part. And in a funny way, I've, I've been out of the service, I feel like I'm doing my part again in another way. <coughs> Excuse me, okay, excellent. Um, oh, have you maintained any of your friendships from the military? One in particular, very close, they're the godparents of our children, uh -huh. uh, active duty couple, and I, when frequent phone calls, and we're trying to see how we can get together for Christmas. Right. Yeah, wonderful military couple. Wonderful, wonderful couple embody all the best of America. They grew up um, with limited financial resources in uh, with Queens or Brooklyn, and uh, the military was a good opportunity for them. And they did it, and they did their all their act. They were did straight active duty time. And we just became close friends, and we we kept up with each other. Okay, and uh, just to wrap, um, how did your uh, how did your service and your experiences affect your life? And did your military experience how did that affect your thinking about about war or the military in general? Oh wow. That's a two-part question, yep. two-part answer. Um, I could say I was raised with a sense of fairness and expectation of fairness that I got from both of my parents, okay? My father, again, chose to become an American and was quite proud to represent America in many
many of his jobs. He was a Peace Corps director, and before that, he was a specialist in Africa right. and worked on the shutting down apartheid in Africa and flew all around the, the continent. We, we looked at his passport, literally had <laughs> all the countries in, with different names because some of them have been renamed since then. But my dad was totally committed to the American ideal. And he, he said this nation, he would say in an accent, this nation is not perfect, but it is the closest thing to perfection that any nation has ever had. And I, he would represent our country and it was really great because where he was going, being a black man with a black man with an accent, a black man who was an immigrant, a black man who was an immigrant who was a lawyer, who loved this nation the way he did, was a fabulous bridge. Fabulous bridge to many of the nations where people are of color. Uh -huh. And they feel like, and these white Americans come in here talking down to me. My dad was, you know, a long glass of, Iced tea in a hot summer, right? right yeah. So he really was very effective. Uh -huh. in, in, but he wasn't BSing. That's what he felt in his heart. Right. So I grew up with that sense of the love of country and the opportunity and realizing that things are imperfect. In fact, my day to day work, I'm a civil rights lawyer. I well know that this nation is imperfect. Right. But I, their opportunity to, to work towards our ideals has always been present. Uh -huh. And it's, it's on all of us to push push that envelope and to work towards these ideals and to, and to realize them as best as we can. So the military really reinforced that belief that process and due process and enforcement of, of laws and rules and regulations equally was going to be a platform where people could feel uh, treated fairly and could put their whole heart and mind into their work which is what the military is supposed to be about. So that reinforced that. It also gave me a sense of dignity and a sense of fairness in my law practice that stemmed from the dignity and respect and fairness that JAGs had for each other. We would never lie to each other. We would never hide evidence. You would get in there and battle and do your motions and your honor, you know, and object, you know, you did your job. Right. You were aggressive, and, but it was always with respect. Uh -huh. And you would shake hands afterwards and someone would win and someone would lose. And sometimes it would be a split decision, you know, but it, it was a lot of respect. And I carry that attitude in my civilian world. Mm -hmm. And I've come across some, some lawyers who are totally dumbfounded. They're like, Cecilia, you said you were going to do that. You did it. You know, you didn't write me a paper, but you, that thing came in the mail, whatever. It's, I'm a woman of my word, and I think a lot of that was reinforced from the military, and I take that forward, and it's definitely helped me in my practice, because judges know whatever Cecile says, she's not, you know, there's something behind it. If she filed a motion, I may not rule for her, but I know it's not frivolous. You know, it's, it's that sense of, of, of being heard and being fair has helped me. Now. You asked another question, I believe, about what do I think about war? How, how after serving, sure. how has it affected your, your perspective? Well, I'm very, I have very strong feelings on this, and I tend to be a little bit long-winded. But um, uh, to point. answer the question, and this is something I felt when I was active duty. I felt that we should have a draft. I did not feel that our inner city youth or our youth from the Midwest where factories were closing and there was less economic opportunities should be the ones that would bear the brunt of our, of our nation's good and bad decisions with regards to warfare. I felt it should be across the board. It should be the way the English do it. They go to war, their princes suit up, the princes go out and, and can be shot down. Generally, that's my understanding of how the British system, be, because I was raised in the British system initially, uh -huh. came back to the States, I was 15. We were taught that the, your leaders would be at the forefront with you. If the nation thought that other people's children could be sacrificed for whatever political decisions or reasons, that should be across the board. It should be you know, um, Bill Gates' son, and the 
farmer's son down the road. Everybody's child should be at risk. Everybody's daughter should be at risk. I just think that keeps fairness, and that's something I've advocated for, and we talked about a lot in JAG school. When we would go for our seminars, sometimes these issues would come up about the draft, and at the time, the majority of the lawyers felt the same way. It should not be something that's borne by any segment of society, a discernible segment. It should be something split, spread across everybody. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge tie-in, it's a huge commonality, it's a, hu it's a huge way to bridge, and there are no others. We're all in it together. Right. So you ask me, that's how I feel. Okay. I still feel that way, and I tested myself. And I know it would have been hard as a mother with my children. I still feel if something, God forbid, we had to go to war, it would be just to have everybody's children at risk, including mine, as heartbreaking as that would be. Right. It just seems immoral to put that burden on people because they need an economic opportunity. And I'm glad the opportunity is there, but it shouldn't just be because the, the factory is closed or I have no other way of, of moving ahead. It should be, it should be across the board. Okay, well, I wanna thank you for a, a great interview. I wanna thank you for your service. Do you feel like there's anything that you left out that you wanted to share? I think we've managed to cover just about everything. <laughs> thank you so much for this opportunity and I wish you good luck in this whole process and I'm looking forward to getting a chance to see some of it. We got it done. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you guys.